Grand Rising, my friends. Welcome back. For those who are new, welcome. For those who have joined me for one or more of these, then hey, welcome back. We're going to have some fun today. I think we're going to get to some interesting information and not going to, it's middle of the week, so I'm just going to jump straight into it. Well, first off, I want to say I know everyone had a good night. And, uh, if you've seen us at a different time, I know you had a good day because we're going to be positive. We're pushing for that. And if there's someone that you love, admire, respect, or you just want to kind of give a boost to their day, then write something kind about them down in the comment section and forward them this video and say, hey, go, go look for what I wrote. It's, it's, it's super easy to find it now. Intel discloses $800,000 investment in crypto exchange Coinbase. So Intel has, is invested in a, a lot of companies, I think over $100 million in publicly traded companies. Barron's claim, therefore, the stock had to disclose those investments to the commission. The report speculates on the possibility that Intel could have pre-purchased the stocks before Coinbase debuted debuted in the U.S. public market in April 2021. Intel, although this constitutes Intel's first major investment in the crypto-related company, the chip manufacturer has been interested in Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, and blockchain technology for years. In 2019, the company filed a patent on Bitcoin mining. The document presented to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office described as a system on a chip, SOC, that optimized Bitcoin Bitcoin miners power consumption. The company was awarded the patent. So Intel has been in the crypto space for a while. And this is just an investment in Coinbase. I'm not sure if, if it would be clear if they would have to uh, declare if they had bought actual Bitcoin or not. But if they're, you know, you imagine they're running nodes and such and using it to, to do their research for um, their their patent, so they must have bought some, you know. Now, if they bought enough on the company treasure versus just uh, more for research purposes, is different stories. But they have bought now an investment in Coinbase, so they do see a future in at least the some of the infrastructure of uh, cryptocurrency. So keeping along the line today, crypto. Wealth managers gain exposure to Bitcoin via Grayscale, according to new SEC filings. New filings with the United States Security and Exchange Commission, or SEC, reveal that four wealth management companies have acquired shares of Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust, offering further evidence of institutional adoption of digital assets. And there are several companies they discuss here, Clear Perspective Advisors, an Illinois-based wealth manager, revealed direct ownership of 7,790 shares of GBTC. Ohio-based Ancora Advisors scooped up 13,945 shares of GBTC as of June 30th. And they say is even though that's small for them because they have more than uh, their multi-billion dollar asset manager. Also reflects an important strategic move given the company's long-term investment perspective. This may just be the dabbling in the water of some of these companies uh, before they go in whole hog on a lot of this. So keep our eyes open on these firms that have to disclose what they've been buying. And until we, as we discussed before, Grayscale is a trust that you can buy shares in now that the Grayscale organization holds Bitcoin and you're able to buy part of their or a, a, a stake into their Bitcoin through this trust, as opposed to an ETF where it will be backed by the physical Bitcoin itself. And Grayscale would like to turn their trust into an ETF. They've applied to as well as the other companies we were mentioning before. So this just saying a lot of wealth managers are putting their money into Grayscale because they either are, you know, maybe don't 
have the technical know-how or want the risk of holding Bitcoin itself. So they're holding it through an intermediary such as Grayscale. Next up, Premier League soccer team to wear Dogecoin shirts in upcoming season. Now, players from English soccer team Watford FC will wear Dogecoin on their shirts this season, according to British sports outlet The Athletic. Dogecoin will appear on all three Watford shirts. The appearance of the meme coin is paid for by sports betting site and crypto casino stake.com. The deal is worth at least, I'm going to say in American money. I was going to say English, but I guess yeah, American English would be pounds, but in, in dollars would be $970,500 and will be paid in cryptocurrency, reported by The Athletic. To create some buzz about the partnership, Stake.com is also plans to give away 10 million Doge. Today worth, well, when they wrote this was worth 2 million. Now 10 million would be worth, I think Doge is at, or was at 30 some since 33 at 30 so hey that's three mil right there off tops you know that would all yeah you, you, you already went up a third already that's why we love the cryptos but this, but this team also had uh bitcoin on their jerseys if not last year previously so they you know they'll sell out to whoever is going to give them some money. But, you know, look, you know, hey, it's a, it's a capitalist system, so why why would they not? Uh, but Doge, yeah, Doge and Shiba Inu. You know, none of this is financial advice. None of this is health advice or any advice that can be misconstrued in any type of way. If you base anything you do or or, or say off what I said, that is on. You. Because if I said it, I said it. So keep an eye on teams now becoming um, will be. I can imagine the Cardano and the DeFi projects will, as they continue to grow, will could start using their ability to market in this way as well. This is not that good. T-Mobile is investigating a reported data breach. And it sounds like a bad one. Over 100 million people are reportedly affected. T-Mobile customers may, may want to brace for some bad news. The mobile service providers investigate a reported data breach that may have exposed the private info of more than 100 million people. The would-be perpetrator is apparently trying to sell off a portion of the data. Vice noted in the Sunday report, the site spoke with the anonymous author of a forum post offering up to roughly one third of T-Mobile U.S. customer data in exchange for six Bitcoin worth less than 280,000 as of August 15th. As of today, just because, eh, similar to this. Just stuck around and saying the same just at around this time. While it all could be BS, Vice was able to look at samples of the data and confirm that the seller had accurate information on T-Mobile customers. The stolen data, which was reportedly obtained from multiple T-Mobile servers, is filled with identifying information, including names, addresses, and phone numbers. Social security numbers, IMEI numbers, which are unique to each mobile device, and driver license info. It is not clear if this data is available for every person exposed in the breach, but the seller did confirm to Vice that their access to T-Mobile servers has not been, oh, sorry, has been cut off, which is good news. On Sunday evening, a T-Mobile spokesperson responded to Mashable's request for a comment with the following statement. We are aware of claims made in an underground forum and have been actively investigating their validity. We do not have any additional information to share at this time. It appears to be this is ongoing, but it, it, it is sounds like this uh, data breach is real and T-Mobile is, of course, going to uh, try to mitigate any of the fallout so they will minimize at first until they you know that like, like everything that happens everything we hear about later is especially when you know you don't know what to look for and it, it, it 
in, in advance is that they'll they'll give you the rope of dope up front and then later on like oh well, it was it was pretty bad but we at first we we tried to let you know that it was we here to protect you I like that I think we'll keep with that we're going to keep with the they're here to protect us every day. Uh, kind of a changing topic, but it, you know, it has a lot to do still with the future and where we're going with all of this and technology innovation and how it applies to the decisions we make is quantum computing. Now, for those who don't know what quantum computing, a uh, uh, really brief and out, do a super brief one here, but you know, this one will be another a video where I'll kind of uh, go a deeper dive and discuss just super briefly um, classical computers the one we're used to use think of it more like a on off switch one or zero what one or zero is it on or off and that's how it works and you do it you know across um, millions of processors across where you're making these decisions of on off and that's how we have all the magic of this but it's basically at that level ones and zeros on and off and being able to interpret that through code a quantum computer each of those and each of those points that are on or off are bits quantum computers their base level is called a, a, a qubit and it can be either on or off or a part of both it can is it's probability. So the, the main thing for such tell people is that instead of being the certainty of on and off, is the probability of on and and how the 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 gradation between yes and no and all the grays in between of the of, of black and white, and how you can almost you know on a level have infinite variation before you get to it, and that's the difference between quantum computing and classical computing. The classical computers have two states, but they use it, manipulate, and give us the internet. They give us quantum computer, all the things we're creating. Uh, but quantum computing will be able to take us much, much further, much faster with its ability to calculate the bigger questions, big giant data sets. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But it's been some breakthroughs, some important things to understand. So. You know, for the most part, the basic function of a quantum computer, not function, but the basic, um, the, the parts of when you get down to the, the small um, quantum silicone, silicone quantum chips, and they have that, that manipulate these uh, qubits. And, and we're at probably now, I want to say, maybe several hundred qubit computers in the quantum world. When we get to a million qubits, that's when we're going to really be flip the, 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 you know, the, the, the metaphoric switch of moving into a quantum age. And then we have to have quantum algorithms, a quantum internet, and all these things are being developed. And, you know, we'll talk somewhat about that. But now understand that these engineers in Sydney had a critical breakthrough. Quantum engineers from UNSW Sydney have made a critical breakthrough in the development of quantum computing technology, solving a problem that has long frustrated scientists and until now represented a major roadblock to the development of the next generation of computers. The problem in question involves spin qubits, which are the basic units of information in a silicon quantum processor. But first, what is a silicon quantum processor? I don't know how much we're going to read through all this, but we'll go through. In classical computing, information is, represent, is represented with electrical charges in silicon. In quantum computing, information will be conveyed through spin, the property of an electron or atom that gives magnetism. So if a silicon quantum processor is the core of a quantum computer and a squint qubit is a unit of information conveyed via the spin of the electrons therein, confused yet? And see, yeah, I knew this, this was going to get to trying to make you confused. Basically, qubit versus bit. Uh, qubit can have almost infinite variation of what it is at a time. Bits are going to have one of the other states. And so and, and then that's one property. Another property is entanglement. So now these bits that we have we have to write code to get them to act together you know bit from one bit one bit one bit we're talking about kilobits 
you know, moving on these many, many as we go, we have to write code to make them work together. But in an entanglement, we use magnetic fields where they become where one bit will do the exact same as another bit. And that's quantum entanglement. Like I said, when we talk about quantum mechanics and in, in to get into the computers, entanglement basically is think of it as like this is that when two qubits are entangled with one another or more than one, you can have mil a million or more than, probably more than millions entangled with each other. When they're entangled, you do one thing to one, it affects the same one, even across distances that faster than light can travel, if that makes sense. And it doesn't make sense because it doesn't make sense to anyone. But even distances is estimated, even distances greater than the speed that light can travel information travels from what's called quantum entanglement. Einstein called it spooky action at a distance because it's spooky. It's, it's the spooky action at a distance is that once these, in, in, in however many the system, and, and I think yeah, we'll talk about some later, but now we're getting into the, and that's at the quantum level we're able to see entanglement, being able to even see it at the microscopic level, which is, larger than the quantum level versus the macroscopic what we live in we don't see and we don't you know we haven't realized where we see entanglement in the macroscopic level of that I'm sure, I'm sure it probably is though because we're finding you know that we as our operating systems as human beings are probably more quantum based than classical and we tend to look at ourselves especially we'll get to that in a second in an article too but without going down the rabbit hole quantum entanglement Two things are entangled, and you do one or the other, the other one is impacted, and you can predict. And it's even the, the, the information is conveyed faster than light, which is fascinating. Uh, blah, 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 blah. So, what they found, let me get to what they did. Oh, yeah. So, they were able to, so previously, uh, a long and short of it, same article with, but with different information, long and short of it. To control these qubits that are entangled, they had to have wires that were right on the chip and under the chip, and they had problems with heat. That's why you got to keep uh, quantum computers at a state that's almost near absolute zero, very, very low, very, very low temperatures, even colder than some, you know, deepest areas of space, super low temperatures. Um, and so some of these wires that they had to have on the chips to be able to uh, manipulate the magnetic fields to, to hold the qubits in place. They had the genius idea of getting rid of the wires and they have now this, what do they call it there? Uh, maybe this is uh, another one. It's in this article. Let me give them the credit because man, it's a genius idea. Uh, Ply and the team then introduced a new component directly above the silicon chips, a crystal prism called a dielectric resonator. When microwaves are directed into the resonator, it focuses the wavelength of the microwave down to much smaller size. The dielectric resonator shrinks the wavelength down below one millimeter. So we now have a very efficient conversion of microwave power into the magnetic field that controls the spins of all the qubits. Genius because it reduced heat, reduced power consumption. You now have uh, an easier way to control more qubits at once. These are the innovations that are taking us into the next level of, of um, quantum computing. And the, in this uh, team here, I want to say in Japan, yeah, researchers in Japan, quantum computing new breakthrough. Uh, researchers in Japan have made a discovery that could unlock opportunities to combine classical and quantum computing technologies in new ways resulting in a massive boost in processing power. Now, spearheaded by Professor Ta Taka Takahiro, Masumoto, Takahiro Masumoto of Nagoya City University, the team of researchers were investigating a concept called quantum entanglement, whereby the interaction between multiple particles is such that it can only be described in relation to one another. Historically, scientists have found it difficult to manufacture quantum entanglement, which is fundamental to quantum computing due to various engineering and logistical challenges. However, Masamoto and his team recently observed a phenomenon that could provide the key, an entangled pair of protons on the surface of a silicon nanocrystal. So 
like you said, proton entanglement has previously been observed in molecular hydrogen and plays an important role in a variety of scientific disciplines. However, the entangled state was found in gas or liquid phases only. Now we have detected quantum entanglement on a solid surface, which can lay the groundwork for future quantum technologies. And what they're thinking is by these entangled protons on these silicon nanocrystals that be able to marry classical computers to the potentiality of quantum processing before we have pure quantum computers. Now, why is all of this important? Well, what, what, what God, quantum mechanics, and consciousness have in common is that the theories to explain all of them, we, we have no clue. Uh, you know, I love that expression as you, you, the more you learn, the more you realize you don't know. And that's one of the truest things in this world is that the more you, you think you understand something. And, and it's, I, I used to, I tell people, the wise have doubt. You know, the truly wise know that their worldview can be changed in a day, in an hour, you know, given sufficient information that uh, is counter to what they believe that's unrefutable. If you're truly wise and you once you see the truth, the truth is what you search for, not being right or wrong. You search for the truth and the truth is the truth. It's, it's sometimes what you want. Sometimes what you don't want, and you have to accept that, and that's fine. That's fine in this world. If you truly want to be a better human being, you're not trying to be right. You want to more uh, walk in truth and fairness. So it's just more of talking about in this article, the author's travels down the, the thoughts of trying to understand quantum mechanics and how it led to the, the belief or non-belief in spirituality and a, a God figure, as well as um, consciousness. What does consciousness mean? And, and, you know, we'll discuss this at some point later, more deep dive into more of a, just discussions of uh, the news items of the days, but consciousness, it's been a lot of theories. And I've always, you know, said I, I, I see it as a symphony that the brain and, you know, and now, you know, as I come to understand quantum, quantum mechanics more and more, I can see it as a symphony of quantum um, systems that when you try to separate them, you may, you know, the pieces may seem beautiful, separate, but the majesty of them together is is that, you know, if you play a piece from a song, you may recognize that, but when you hear it as it was to be played with all the pieces together is, is sometimes is words cannot describe that. So, you, you know, can we ever truly understand all of these, these things? No, I don't think we can ever truly understand the, the true nature of God, you know, there's an expression that uh, um, the Tao that can be named is not the true Tao. And that's uh, most people, you know, Tao, Tao, T-A-O is pronounced Tao, D-A-O. I may be wrong about that. Correct me. I'm, things I hear and I try to double check it to make sure it's right. But hey, it is what it is. But and, that, and that's how I see um, the creator universe is that we're not meant to truly understand everything. of it. Our brains couldn't comprehend that, you know, um, even when. We pass from this plane and move on. I don't know if I see us. I see ourselves. I see us as a reflection of the divine. So, you know, could a piece of a, of a piece of a glass understand that the, the function of a mirror? I, you know, but you know, I'm I'm fine being that soldier in that piece. <laughs> so that, that's where I'm at with that. The and consciousness, you know, is such. Is it only is it only held by humans? Our other, our, you know, you, you, if you have a pet, you would be like, of course your, your, your pet is conscious. It's, it understands. But there's levels of consciousness, you know. Are there levels of consciousness in humans? That, that we have a lot, a lot of this, there's no way to, to say what is, you can't Google the answer to it. There's no, no way to, you know, test. 
you know, we hey, look, maybe, hey, we have a computer that can test consciousness and then had to test what d degree of consciousness level you were at. Um, I'm thinking of those uh, photography, I don't want to butcher, Carillion, Carillion photography, where they look at your aura, where it's supposed to be your levels of spirituality, which, you know, your measure be some level of consciousness. So, rambling, go let y'all go. I love you. Love yourself, because God loves us, and have a beautiful day.